U.S. Attorney, Northern District of Alabama, who will get us started and is responsible for all of you being here. It's a proud moment for this community to be willing to step up, look a serious problem in the eye, and address it. Uh, that's one of the things that we do best here. Heroin addiction is a serious problem, and it demands that sort of serious consideration. It demands a community strategy that brings together people who are perhaps working in isolation on their end of the problem. Law enforcement, medical professional, teachers, all of those people need to be together in a room discussing the problem and the solution. So that's what today is about. We wouldn't be here today without the work of an awful lot of people, probably too many people for me to stand here and thank individually. But you see many of the entities that participated in this. And I, I would be remiss if I didn't tell you the names of the five people who have put tremendous effort into this project over the last six months, because it's been an honor to work with them. Mark Wilson, the Jefferson County Public Health Officer, who you'll hear from in a panel in a few moments, has just been a key player in putting this day together. Also, Max Michael, who you just heard from, the Dean of UAB's School of Public Health, has been instrumental in bringing us together and providing us with this amazing facility for today's event. Lyndon Laster is the law enforcement and community coordinator in my office, and I'm pretty sure he slept in this building last night, putting the finishing details on today's meeting. Peggy Sanford, our public information officer, whom I know many of you have talked to, put together uh, an important piece of this meeting, which is making sure that the right people in the community knew about it and are here in the room today. And finally, Sean Dorcheka, who you'll hear from later today, is the leader of a group in Birmingham called the Addiction Prevention Coalition. And their work will help us inform the community in a coordinated way. We appreciate the partnership with all of these groups. I can't really remember a time when my office has worked with doctors, and it's been a refreshing experience and a positive one. I hope the information that you all will hear today will reflect the hard work and preparation that has gone into this. I want to leave you with one thought before we hear from the folks um, who are specialists in their areas. Now look, I don't typically read the commenters on AL.com because we all know what a rabbit hole that is. But I happened to look at the comments when the first story uh, about this event was written. And I want to read one of the comments to you. This is a commenter uh, who goes by the name HBTD8085. And the comment with me announcing the summit was, you can never have too many summits. Maybe she can follow it up with a strongly worded letter. And there is a truth in that comment that we would do well to listen to. Now I want to transition to introduce our speaker. Jaylee Tucker is a clinical psychologist with public health experience who is professor and former chair of the Department of Health Behavior at the UAB School of Public Health, research director of the UAB Center for the Study of Community Health, and director of the UAB Center for AIDS Research Behavioral and Community Science Corps. Dr. Tucker has 30 years of NIH-funded research guided by behavioral economics on substance abuse and related risk behaviors using urban and rural community dwelling and treatment populations. Her recent projects include community-based studies of natural recovery from alcohol problems, peer-driven sam peer sampling studies of health risk and protective behaviors among African-American emerging adults living in disadvantaged urban communities, and research on health risk and protective behaviors among rural substance abuse users living with HIV AIDS. Dr. Tucker has written or edited three books and has contributed over 100 journal articles and book chapters. Her extensive service le leadership record includes multiple contributions to the American Psychological Association. She is a fellow of the American Psychological Association and has served as associate editor and editorial member of multiple journals, including currently the Journal of Studies on Alcohol and Drugs and Psychology of Addictive Behaviors. Dr. Tucker recently retired from UAB after more than 14 years as a faculty member in the Department of Health Behavior and served as the chair of that department since 2008. This summer, she returns to the University of Florida as professor and chair of the Department of Health Education and Behavior in the College of Health and Human Performance. She will also lead the college's Center for Digital Health and Wellness. 
Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jay Lee Tucker, who will address public health perspective on the new opiate epidemic. Jay Lee. This is a wonderful opportunity for us to get together and share information and ideas and to try to formulate a multi-component coordinated strategy to address this very serious problem. So let me begin by acknowledging my main collaborators in this area, including in preparation of this talk. I'd like to acknowledge two people that are here at UAB, Dr. Kathy Simpson. Kathy, if you're here, would you wave? Okay, she should be here soon. And then uh, Ms. Susan Chandler. These are folks, she's back there in the very back. These are folks that I work with at UAB. Um, I also want to acknowledge the contributions of my longtime collaborator and colleague, Dr. Keith Humphreys, who is at Stanford Medical School. Um, Keith had the distinction of working for two years as a senior policy analyst in the White House Office of Drug Control Policy during the first Obama administration. And he was very helpful here in giving me material to do what I want to do today, and that is to give you the view from 30,000 feet on the drug problem in the United States and solutions and different strategies that have been tried with varying degrees of success. Later in the day, everything is going to come down to the ground concerning Jefferson County, as it should. But what I want to do today is to give you that big picture, the context, the concepts and some very important findings about what has worked and what has not so that you can pick your way today through the many ideas that undoubtedly we will discuss. The three main strategies that I want to present, which will be familiar to some of you, are drug supply reduction strategies, drug demand reduction strategies, and harm reduction strategies. And I'm going to put my emphasis on drug demand reduction strategies, mainly because I think this is the area that there is the most room for improvement and opportunity in the United States. Harm reduction has been very successful in Europe, in Canada, Australia, and so forth, but it is not congruent with the U.S. war on drugs in large measure, and it is not consistent with the majority political values, and so I'm going to mention it, but take away from it what you can, but I don't see that as the main direction that we're likely to take as a group. I want to leave you with a message that change is possible. It really, really is. There are solutions out there. And as um, Attorney General Vance has already said, it's going to take everybody in the room sharing ideas to develop a coordinated strategy. And that includes the recovery community all the way to expert level. I want to start with history. That's what people in academia tend to do. Um, we like to learn what happened before, where we came from, how do we get to our present state. Endogenous opium use has been widespread throughout human history. The medicinal properties of opium have been well known, and in general, so has its addictive potential. And Throughout history, the majority of opiate use has taken place without widespread harm. This all changed, however, during the colonial era when international trade routes were opened. And I think the best example of this, if you want to get into the literature and read about the complexities of problems that happen when people start trying to traffic drugs legally, um, is the British East India Company in the 1800s. They were determined to sell opium to the Chinese. There's something familiar there about trying to get into the Chinese market. Um, they, the Chinese didn't want them. They were so determined that they had the British government go to war, not once but twice, with the Chinese to keep those markets open. So there's a lot of money here to be made. Um, the colonial powers had interest in being um, opiate suppliers, and in general, this has been important as a difference with the U.S. economy, which tended at the time to be very agrarian, farm-based, and we also were geographically isolated. And this difference has led to an enduring um, difference in the approach to drug control. The other countries have tended to emphasize regulation. The U.S. has tended to emphasize prohibition. 
think we need to recognize that demand for drugs is a constant. Um, it's going to be out there. You're not going to stop drug use, and I think you have to accept that. But the question is, can we reduce the damage, the harm, and especially the downstream negative consequences of people that become addicted and overdose? It's generally profitable to engage in drug trade, and what this does is that it encourages the distillation or concentration of the drug product. And so it inevitably pushes out the dangerousness of drugs. So think of marijuana compared to THC, um, beer and wine compared to distilled spirits, chewing coca leaf in South America compared to cocaine, which is more concentrated, and then to crack. And then today's topic, opium to heroin. It's easier to transport. You can get an awful lot more drug in a smaller package and carry it over longer distances. It's also important to recognize that the profit motive affects all economic sectors, both licit and illicit. And very importantly, these sectors interact with one another. They are a big marketplace that includes legitimate pharmaceutical marketing, illicit marketing, and something that we call gray marketing, which tends to be outside the borders of current law. So Big Pharma has always had an interest in opium and opiates and their manufacture. And there really was legitimate concern in the, late, uh, in the 1990s for improved, main manage improved pain management. Our population is aging. Um, and physicians wanted better tools to do this um, to make sure that people were managing their pain effectively, and we will hear more about that today. But this led pharmaceutical companies, at least some of them, like Purdue Pharmaceuticals, who have been responsible for OxyContin, to engage in aggressive marketing, primarily to primary care settings. Okay, We're not talking about to surgeons and, and people who work in hospitals. We're talking about people who do not have a background typically in addiction medicine. And oxycodone products, of which oxycontin is the best example, were said to be less addictive when they were first introduced. And that, we know, is just not true. And Purdue Pharmaceutical was uh, taken to court and fined a lot of money. They paid it, and they recouped it, and then some within a couple of years. The use of these prescription medications quickly extended beyond the patient recipients of them to new and established users for a variety of recreational and medicinal purposes. And while all of this was going on, licit opium dependence grew as a result of having these prescription drugs available, but at the same time, cheap Colombian heroin was flooding the U.S. mainly through the East Coast using older cocaine trafficking routes. So this led to the perfect storm that brings us here today. Um, this situation created new pathways to heroin use and abuse. It created a new user generation, um, and it was a very profitable expanded marketplace. As always, a subset of people that use these drugs became dependent. There was understandable and real alarm over the situation. And so the pharmaceutical industry made an effort to, if you will, police itself when in August of 2010, Purdue Pharmaceutical changed the coding on the popular, powerful OxyContin so that it was harder to use it in non-pill form. And up until then, the um, OxyContin could be readily ground up, snorted or injected when it was uh, dissolved in water. And predictably, and some people predicted this, and sadly, there was a rapid shift to epidemic heroin use. This was a widely available cheap substitute. And this, I think, is very important to emphasize because it, it illustrates what happens or what can happen when drug control tactics are done in isolation without concern with the broader context. And so I put this picture of Medusa down here because the situation is a lot like that. You cut off a tentacle, they grow back two more. And unfortunately, this is a complex problem that we can't cut off the head of the Medusa to solve. 
Uh, those of you that are not familiar with this, I wanted to put this slide in here that shows the original formulation of OxyContin and then the new formulation. I think you can see um, here what happens, the difference when you try to grind it up and then when you put the new formulation in water, it becomes uh, gelatinous, uh, it's goo, and it is very difficult to inject, whereas the older form was readily dissolved in water. So to bring us to our current status, four in five people today who, st who started using heroin first became dependent on prescription opioids. Okay, let's stop a minute and think about that. This is something that started in the illicit drug market. The number of annual prescriptions for opioids in the U.S. over the past five to ten years exceeds the number of adults in the United States. I mean, I didn't get one last year. I imagine many of you did not get one last year. So somebody is getting a lot of prescriptions for these drugs. And what has happened is that this has flooded the market. I mean, there has been leakage, um, and it's, it's in every medicine cabinet of people that have been to the dentist. They don't use it all, um, and who've had surgeries and so forth. And so it has come to affect a broad and new segment of the U.S. population. And one of the most challenging negative consequences of this is that Drug overdosing from these drugs is now the leading cause of accidental death in the United States. And this causes more deaths than traffic fatalities, gun homicides, or suicides. A lot of times people don't believe that. Um, but this is a major public health problem. The number of overdoses have quadrupled since 1999. And sadly, the greatest vulnerability to overdose is after a period of abstinence. Okay, so what do we do? I think you're going to hear this message a lot today. I think the first thing we need to do is to turn down the volume on the drug culture war screaming and listen. People have very strong opinions about this topic. I think we need to consider all the options, and we've got to think strategically about coordinated solutions. And I think we need to try to learn from history and the evidence base about the pros and cons of different drug control strategies and policies and behavior change interventions. So before I get into talking about the three main strategies that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, I'm going to make a short diversion through some basic principles of change. Uh, some of this will be familiar to some of you. I want to talk about some basic principles and tools from behavioral science, from public health and economics, and then briefly mention how this pertains to um, drug control, and then we'll get into talking about the strategies. The first contribution from behavioral science is behavior is controlled by its consequences. So if you want to change behavior, you need to change the consequences. And there are two general tactics to do this. One is to punish the negative behavior. And if this is applied swiftly and consistently, it will suppress the behavior. It is very effective at doing that, but you take it away and the odds are the behavior is going to rebound and return. A better way to change behavior is to reward positive change. And this is very important in shaping new behaviors as well as maintaining change. The most effective intervention programs put these two tactics together in a way that optimizes their effectiveness. And I think we'll hear today about some contingency management programs that do this very well, including in Jefferson County. And then last, knowledge and education isn't enough to promote behavior change. It may be a necessary condition, but it's not sufficient. And this is one of the reasons that school-based education programs about drugs have serious limitations. Okay, from public health, one of the most important concepts is, is the population perspective. And 
it's very easy, I think, when you have a very serious problem like overdosing for people to focus on that and forget that there's a whole distribution out there of other individuals that have varying degrees of risk. And the prevention paradox, which is well supported, shows that the bulk and cost of a given disease is due to the middle of the bell curve of the distribution of people who have mild to moderate problems or risk. And so what this means in terms of strategy is that you don't want to throw all your resources into intervening at the tail of the distribution, the upper tail of the distribution. You really need, if you want to have population impact on health, to also be very concerned with the middle of the bell curve. And one way to exploit that is to, is to have interventions, even ones with weak effects, but disseminate them broadly over the population. And you can have a, a significant impact on overall population health with that strategy. Um, intervention w in the tail is very important, but it's just part of the spectrum of possibilities. And then the last area that I want to mention uh, is economics. And I imagine, you know, the law of supply and demand is very familiar to, to you. But what I want to add here and emphasize is that it operates in a context of choice. At any point in time, we're all making choices between multiple commodities that are available under varying constraints. Um, and what you choose at any point in time is going to depend on what else is available. And so what that means is that if you um, increase the constraints on a given commodity, like drugs, Demand for it is going to decrease, but you're also going to incentivize a search for substitutes. And that is certainly what has happened here with um, the current heroin epidemic. And if the constraints are severe, you will incentivize a black market. Okay, let's see. So to pull this back to the topic of the day, namely drug-related behavior and drug control, I want to make the point that these principles apply to drug use, misuse, and recovery behaviors. They're not an exception. Another couple of points from a population perspective that are important, I think, to describe is that most people who try drugs, and that's a lot of people, they don't continue to use, and they don't develop problems. Of those who do develop problems, most will change their substance use on their own because they get negative cues from their natural environment, from their families, from social networks, from churches, and so forth, from, from peers. But when they can't or when they don't, other forces inevitably are going to come into play. Some of these are helpful and some of them are not. And now I'd like to switch to the strategies. Um, there are a couple that are more, um, I would call, naturally occurring. The first two here. And these are the social, religious, and educational approaches that are very powerful and exert extraordinary influence on behavior. Um, but this is really outside the scope of what we are able to be concerned with today. But it's very real. A second important tool and strategy are our mutual help groups and the recovery community. I think people who have successfully have recovered will tell you how absolutely vital this has been and how important it has been in being able to maintain their recovery. So I want to acknowledge the importance of both of these um, strategies, but now move and spend my time on the last three. The U.S. War on Drugs epitomizes a drug supply reduction strategy. The idea here is that if you get the drugs out of the environment, you will eliminate drug use and abuse. And it has some effects. Uh, the main way this has been done in the United States is through border control, uh, drug interdiction, and policing at every level, uh, imposing criminal penalties for possession use and particularly drug trafficking. You can increase other costs price, taxes, seizing property, and so forth. 
This is the most widely implemented approach in the United States. It is very expensive. There have been billions of dollars poured into this approach. The data are quite clear that the success has been limited at best. Put another way, I think we can say that the maximum effectiveness of this particular strategy has likely to be, have been reached. So we got to look somewhere else if we want to see where the opportunities are for change. Another point to make here is that this approach and the U.S. war on drugs has had some pretty serious unintended negative consequences. Uh, the mandatory minimum drug sentencing laws have reduced judicial discretion. The impact of this approach on minorities, particularly minority males, has been um, disproportional and very negative. All you got to do is look in the jails and you can see the effects. So let me now switch to where I think there are opportunities for new tools and new interventions. And that is in the area of drug demand reduction strategies. There are a couple of ways to go about this, one of which is to enrich the environment, the community environment, with positive activities that compete with drug use. Now, I know that so sounds simple-minded. And I also know that during the first Clinton administration that, you know, they kind of got laughed out of the room by proposing midnight basketball programs in inner cities like Detroit. It actually was good strategy, but it didn't have political traction. But another way that I think might is after school programs that bridge that temporal period from when kids get out of school until they get home with their parents in the evening. That is when a tremendous amount of mischief delinquency and crime occurs in this age group. And there are ways to expand sports so that it's not just for the elite athletes, club programs, and so forth. Uh, I think this is an area that is ripe for systematic development. The other important piece of this is the need to expand prevention, early intervention, and treatment availability. Um, this strategy remains underutilized in the U.S., even though I think people now recognize that it's one that's very important, and it costs a whole lot less than drug supply interventions. What this means when you start talking about interventions, which you're going to hear a lot more about today, is that we need a fleshed-out spectrum of services that correspond to risk status. There are good evidence-based treatments available, but they tend to serve those individuals with the most serious problems and dependence. And they are a minority group. They're very important, but they are a minority group. And ideally, we can intervene more upstream than downstream. Um, even then, the slots for treatment and access to treatment is quite limited. Treatment tends to be high threshold with waiting lists. Um, they're not as bad as they once were, but they're still not good. Treatment is costly. It's inconvenient, especially if it's hospital-based, and it remains stigmatized. People don't want to do this unless they have to. Another barrier is that there are important gaps in the spectrum of interventions and continuum of care, insurance coverage is uneven. It has improved considerably for hospital-based detoxification and treatment services. Um, intensive outpatient services are now well covered to a point. But what is lacking is coverage for residential treatment or day treatment or treatments that are long in duration for people who have very serious problems and it's just not going to be enough for them to have hospital-based care or outpatient care. Um, this is, it, it, it's not covered. The programs are out there. And it's important because one of the principles um, of effective drug abuse treatment, according to the National Institute on Drug Abuse, is that longer treatment duration predicts better outcomes. There have been positive developments. One of which is that the Affordable Care Act now includes as a benefit substance abuse treatment, at least for the things that I have mentioned that are covered. 
Another positive development that we'll hear about today is um, drug court and mandated treatment. This is becoming more accepted and it's becoming more widely available. And then another one that I want to mention is the collegiate recovery community. These, this is a nationwide program that is now expanding um, so that students who are an important part of our risk group here who go through addiction and are in recovery, they want to go back to school, they want to pick up where their lives were disrupted, but they go back to college into an environment that is incredibly rich with um, drug using opportunities. And so what this does is it, it is a sober community on campus and Texas Tech has the premier model. There is a one that's much closer if you're interested in learning more about it at Kennesaw State University and then I have been told that the University of Alabama has one. Okay, I'm looking at you. This is good. Um, I don't know about UAB. Does anybody know? I figure if I didn't know, they don't. But anyway, there, there's, again, there's room for improvement here. Okay, so to sum this up and put it into a visual, on the left here, you have a pie chart that shows the U.S. population and the distribution of risk throughout the population, and most people have low or no risk. The sector that has moderate risk, that is where there is a real opportunity for upstream prevention that is targeted and selective to the risk groups. And then you have indicated prevention, which is really treatment for those who have developed signs and symptoms or can be diagnosed with a substance use disorder. Um, that sector, which I'm calling the treatment sector, I've amplified over here on the right to show you some of the important pieces of services. Um, a large, perhaps most people will get some kind of treatment, either inpatient or outpatient treatment, with or without detox. I've already mentioned the need for residential treatment, which is not well covered. But then another piece here that is absolutely vital is aftercare. For people who develop serious problems, you have to think about this as a chronic disease that's relapsing and remitting. Much like diabetes, blood pressure, people, hypertension, people have to be monitored for risk and developments of problems their whole lives. And we're talking about the serious end of the continuum here. Um, there are many, many tools that can be brought to bear. Uh, relapse prevention, um, pharmacosubstitute monitoring of medications, suboxone, these thing, things like this, methadone, uh, buphenorphine, and then behavioral monitoring um, with step care options when people get into trouble. And this can be done at a distance with a variety of telehealth options, including just the basic telephone. And then mutual help groups in the recovery community are an ever-present resource in the treatment as well as the natural community. So let me finish up here with one slide about harm reduction strategies because I think that this is something we need to know about and use pieces of it to the extent that we, we can because this is an evidence-based approach. And it was developed originally in response to the HIV risk of injection drug use. And what harm reduction strategies and policies attempt to do is to reduce the negative consequences and harms and cost of substance use, but not necessarily reducing use per se. It's great if that happens, but that is not the primary goal. Most programs at work Criminal penalties remain for drug trafficking and any violent crime that's associated with drug use, but treatment is offered to the individual user, the person that is arrested for possession, and in some countries like Great Britain, the severely dependent who cannot get off of methadone they have, in some occasions, maintained them very long term. We're talking about years on pharmaceutical grades, small doses of heroin, so that these people can function and hold jobs, and the health consequences are much less horrible when you do that. But, but again, that's a British experiment, um, but it's worked. 
Clean needle exchanges, I think, are well known. It's important to emphasize that they have been very effective in reducing HIV transmission, and they have done so without increasing drug use or increasing the number of new users, which were, is always a real fear about harm reduction strategies. A harm reduction strategy that I'm pretty sure we're going to talk about today is it directly addresses fatal overdoses by making um, Narcan, which is an opiate antagonist available, and then Good Samaritan laws so that people who are using drugs with somebody who gets in trouble and is overdosing can call 911 and have the police and paramedics show up without getting arrested themselves. So to end, I want to bring this back to the individuals who have been most directly affected by drugs and heroin dependence. And those are the individuals that have become dependent and addicted. I think it's incredibly important that we pay attention to the consumer. And they are the consumers either of drug use or of services. And this is becoming very widely recognized in many disciplines. And I've got a couple of quotes up here from two of them. The first one comes from a behavioral economist who says, successful progress will depend on a realization that drug treatment is an open economy, meaning that we freely choose it, in which the benefits of treatment are an economic good evaluated in a competitive marketplace. Or to put it another way, as well stated by someone who was a frontline HIV worker involved with injection drug users, we need to make it as easy to get services as it is to get drugs. Thank you.